So last time what we talked about was uh, a couple things. We set out uh, a set of construction rules uh, that we call the static discipline for how to assemble, um, given a, a combinational device building blocks, we the static discipline are, are rules that uh, constrain how, what a combinational device uh, has to do. Um, and then what we did was we figured out how to hook those up in big acyclic networks, being careful not to short any outputs together. And when we did so, we discovered that we could actually build very, very large systems and we could, you know, you could put together some of the building blocks to make your own uh, new larger building block, and then I could borrow your building block and use that to build my system. So this sort of tinkertory construction principle was possible, and it was made possible through the use of this digital signaling, where what we did is we described using the standard range of voltages that went from zero up to some power supply voltage at this end. And we divided that up into a couple different regions. So we, we have these four voltage specifications. So any voltage less, the, any de legal device, if it wants to output a, a logic zero, has to output a voltage less than VOL. If it wants to output a logic one, this is on the output side, it has to output a voltage greater than VOH. And then on the input side, we had a different specification involving VIL and VIH. Okay, so these were the range of voltages that were considered inputs. And the difference between the output, if I'm sending information to you, what, between what I have to output and what you accept as inputs, this is called the noise margin. And the noise margin was very important to us because it was this, our, our ability to restore slightly flaky si signals as they traveled from the output of one device to the input to the next device, our ability to restore those values back to something um, that, was, that didn't have the noise, that's what made digital systems allow us to have this tinker toy principle. So when we put all that together, in, in this case what I've done is, is showing you the voltage transfer curve. Just remind you what that is, right? That's a plot. If I pick a, a series of measurements where I select a particular input voltage, so I, I pick different points along the x-axis, and then I measure the output, and voltage, output voltage of, in this case, the, the inverter, what I'll get is um, a series of data points that tell me for any particular input voltage what the corresponding output voltage was. And as we take that sort of analog world and map it on to the digital world afforded by these voltage specifications, we end up with these shaded regions. And those shaded regions correspond to, think how they work, right? So anything, any input voltage that's uh, a legal zero, in other words, any voltage between zero, the origin, and VIL, so that's a legal low, uh, uh, the voltages that we're going to, range of voltages that we're going to use to represent a Boolean zero, um, if we do that, then uh, we expect the device to eat output some sort of legal output voltage, valid in to valid out. And what that would mean is that we would expect the device to produce a voltage that's less than VOL or greater than VOH, which means that any legal combinational device, the voltage transfer curve, has to go through um, around those two shaded regions, which correspond to valid in but invalid out. So we don't ever want our devices to out produce an output voltage for a specific input voltage that falls in one of those shaded regions. And uh, the fact that the ne that middle region here between VIL and VIH on the x-axis is narrower than it is tall, that was because we had positive noise margins. Alrighty, and it's the noise margins that allow our devices to work reliably in a whole range of environments. If we have lots of gain, so what's gain? So in terms of that gain is sort of the measure, if I make a little bit of change on the input voltage, how much of a change of the output voltage do I get? And so a device that has lots of gain would have a big change in the output given only a little change on the input. How is that reflected in the graph? Graphically, how is gain represented? It's the slope of, of that curve. So as the slope gets steeper and steeper and steeper, the device has a big gain. In other words, if I only make a small input change here, I go from, say, at this point in the, in the x-axis, just over just a little bit to this point, you can see the output, chain, output voltage changes dramatically. It goes, it falls 
precipitously. So that device has very high gain in that region. So uh, lots of gain means that we can basically move these two uh, VIL and VIH closer and closer in, closer together, and that would allow us to create uh, uh, hopefully better and better noise margins. Yes, question. Well, it's important as this thing, so this transition here where the large gain is exhibited is actually, it's, it, it's those, that's a region in which the device by and large is producing illegal output voltage. So it can't correspond to any, any legal input voltage because then the device wouldn't be a combinational device. So in some sense, just because of the way we set things up, we always expect the high gain region to be in the gap between the two pink regions. Okay, that represents an input voltage that's in the forbidden zone. In other words, we have no particular specification for the device in, in that area. Okay, so what would be the ideal voltage transfer curve? If you could come up and say, okay, Chris, I understand what you're saying. If I were going to draw the ideal V in versus V out curve, what would it be? Something that gave me the best possible noise margins. Yes? Right, it would look, for an inverting device, it would look like this, where this would be basically have almost infinite gain in the middle. And for a non-inverting device, it would, it would uh, start low and go high. So, so we would hope to be able to build devices that look like that. We would like them to be cheap and small. And we would like to dissipate as little power as possible. Ch charging and discharging you know, the, the, you know, the electrons um, off, of, off of a wire with a little bit of capacitance will, will have to dissipate a little bit of power, at least in the technologies that we're using. Um, but we'd like that to be as small as possible, and I'll come back to that. And finally, we want to build devices that will allow us to build computers and, and watches and cell phones. And, and so we're going to start as we starting to look at how to actually wire together uh, electronic devices to build combinational circuits, we're going to be very interested in making sure that we can implement interesting functions.